I'm informed that we are now live. So um, I'll open the meeting by saying welcome to everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome to the cabinet meeting. Um, the first item on the agenda is apologies, and I have an apology from Councillor Pete Sudbury. So if you could note that, Chris, I'd be grateful. Um, the second item is declarations of interest. Um, Councillor Miller. Thank you, Leader. Um, I have a non-pecuniary interest uh, that relates to item six, insofar as I am a volunteer rugby coach at Gosford All Blacks Rugby Club. Thank you. Do I have any other declarations of interest from anybody? Ah, oh, Councillor Ligo, you, I've just asked about declarations of interest. Do you have any declarations of interest? Non-pecuniary interest. The, um, the class of can you sit? Can you sit down and let me know? <laughs> Did, did you want to? Not did um, younger age groups in the past. So it's in relation to item six on the agenda. OK, it is, thank yeah. you very much. Do I have anybody else with a declaration of interest on any of the items on this agenda? No. OK, thank you very much indeed. So um, we'll now move on to item uh, to item number three, which is the minutes of the last meeting. And I will page those as we go. And if anybody's got any comments or questions that they want to raise, please let me know. So, <clears throat> um, page, sorry, page, it, it's actually, oh, I'm really sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm using this on the computer today because I've agreed to um, participate in our trial for a paperless, um, paperless meetings. And I'm actually now having to find my way through to the minutes. Um, so minutes are on page one to 18. Um, so <coughs> page one, page two, page three, page four, page five, page six, page seven, page eight, Page nine, page ten, and that's the end of that. There are the other items of the uh, questions from councillors. Is there anything anybody wants to raise on the minutes? Um, I will sign those then as a correct record. Thank you very much. So we'll move on <clears throat> now to item number four, which is questions from councillors and um, Councillor Housen. Um, do you have a supplementary question? Uh, I do. Thank you very much, Leader. Um, I have to point out that unfortunately the question itself is now inaccurate because I've been told that that resurfacing is not going to happen in this financial year in March and has now been pushed back to some unspecified date uh, in the next year. Um, I am very disappointed that what started off as 12 million is now down to three million uh, because as the budget papers show uh, 700,000 has been spent on the abortive scheme that was discussed in 2021 and another 250,000 um, is apparently being spent this year. Um, as a result of that I find it difficult and wish to ask the cabinet member why having spent that money this year we are unable to have a time scale before we can at least even go out to consultation. Is it perhaps because so much money uh, in this area is being spent in the rest of the county and the rural areas on 20 mile an hour uh, speed projects that money is being taken out of highways in the city? Because this is the one remaining project in my division. Uh, thank you, Councillor. The answer to your last question is no. The 20 mile an hour scheme is a completely different budget. Uh, so there is no um, cross uh, dependency between those uh, two things. Um, in terms of the spend for the Woodstock Road, um, I share your disappointment that the original budget of 12 million got whittled down firstly to, to, to four and now to three. And um, as you will know, that was because of pressures that emerged on the housing homes from infrastructure stream of the growth deal um, from inflation and other factors uh, towards the end. 
Um, that scheme has been subject to um, letters from government, as you know, also within recent times and the process of finalising exactly how the schemes on the current list will be progressed and when is still going on. As you will know, that was discussed at the Future Oxygen Partnership only yesterday, and uh, we hope and expect that it will become clear uh, in the very near future. Um, I would also just thank Councillor Howson for his um, uh, dogged um, pursuit of the much needed improvements on the Woodstock Road. Uh, he and I have been fighting for this for a long time. It is needed. And also just point out that as the answer to his question acknowledges, they are also required to deliver the benefits of the traffic filters part of the core schemes. So they will happen. We just don't know exactly what or when, but I hope we will find out soon and you'll be the first to know. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Councillor Walker to Councillor Brighouse. Um, do you have a supplementary question? She's not allowed to ask but she's, she's asked two questions. Oh, oh, OK. Oh, right. oh, I'm told you're not allowed to ask a supplementary. I'm really sorry. <laughs> um, OK, and the other one is from Councillor Walker to Councillor Phillips, but I presume the same rule applies. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. So we'll move on now to the next item on the agenda, petitions and public address. Um, now, we've got a very well, a, a lengthy list of speakers who want to speak on item number six. So we're going to move straight on to that. and. Um, I would like to first of all thank everybody that's been in touch with us about um, the uh, this particular paper on the football club. We've had an enormous amount of correspondence. There are strong views on either side which have been expressed. Um, and I'd like to ask people to respect each other's views. Everybody is entitled to speak in this council chamber. Um, but please respect each other's views and we as the cabinet will listen carefully to what each, what each of the speakers has to say. So um, I'm going to say first of all that all the speakers have got three minutes each. Um, there are three councillors who want to speak and they will have five minutes each. So I'd like to invite the first speaker who is Paul Peros um, to come and address this cabinet. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Paul Paros and I'm chairman of Oxvox, the Independent Supporters Trust. A consultation by the County Council nearly a year ago found 80% of respondents were in favour of moving this process forward to planning. 8,000 people have signed a petition supporting the stadium. 700 of those live in the OX5 postcodes. We are residents. We are locals. We are doctors and nurses and car workers and judges. I sit in shouting distance of Knights of the Realm, TV presenters and vicars. We are part of this community. I lived in Kidlington for nearly 10 years and I own two businesses in the village. I am part of the community. To ignore our voice is to deny democracy to a large sex section of our county just because we support our local team. It is heartbreaking to me the parts of the community aspect of this plan may be lost in the switch to the triangle. But the council asked the club to be flexible in their their approach, and they have been. I ran through the objections to Stratfield Break yesterday, and since the switch, it seems like only one remains. The site is on Greenbelt. Unloved, unused, penned in, fenced off Greenbelt. This land represents a tiny slice of that Greenbelt, but a massive part of our future. The extraordinary needs of a growing community and a 130 year old community club could be catered for in one brave move. A community hub that would safe, safeguard the house, safeguard the site from housing development and be an asset to the whole of Oxfordshire, not just a barren field to be fought over for some sort of Pyrrhic victory. The first of the Greenbelt designations began in 1975. The club had already been at the centre of the community for 80 years by then and was moving up the leagues to the top division and cup glory. We have an opportunity to put right mistakes made 30 years ago by the City Council, the then owners and others, and we can secure this club in writing to a financially sustainable home for centuries to come. The Cabinet have a chance to press through the recommendations of its own Council. They can shape the heads of term to both safeguard the club and the local community and make sure we are never in this position again. 
I beg the cabinet not to tie this project up in endless consultation. Those that oppose would see this club stagnate and die as these take place. Meaningful cons consultation takes place in pre-planning and planning where the residents of Kidlington and Oxfordshire can examine detailed plans and make, de make informed decision based on facts, not on scare stories. I spoke before this council nearly a year ago and was told then you needed time to examine this proposal. I beg you now not to delay that decision again, or the clanging sound that we hear won't be the can being kicked down the road, but the death knell of our club and a huge part of our community. Thank you very much indeed. Um, the next speaker we have is Councillor David Roby, who is the chair of Kidlington Parish Council. Good afternoon. I'm speaking as chair of Kidlington Parish Council. For Kidlington, there are strong arguments for and against United Stadium project. We have 14,000 residents and not surprisingly, opinions are deeply divided. The Parish Council's position on Stratfield break was to remain neutral until we had plans with detailed answers to our questions about residents, concerns and aspirations. In the case of the Triangle, our status is quite different. We are leaseholders of Stratfield Break, but we have no rights over the Triangle, though it is in Kidlington. Nevertheless, it's our duty to represent as best we can the interests of residents. We think we do this by taking the same provisional position on the Triangle as we did on Stratfield Break, to remain neutral until our questions are fully answered. For the most part, these questions match the County Council's objectives on the agenda paper, but we would like to see some made much more explicit. What non-sporting as well as sporting benefits would there be for residents? Exactly what mitigations of noise, traffic congestion and parking will there be? We need a lot more details. Maintaining the green barrier between Kidlington and Oxford is very problematic in the case of the Triangle. As a result of the planned new housing developments north of Cutslow, building on the Triangle could effectively remove the barrier. What is the long-term dependability of commitments that club might, may make? We have respect for the present management, but who knows what might happen in the future? We don't want a white elephant on such a prominent site. It's therefore vital that the County Council's engagement with the club today should be non-binding. If a firm decision is made in favour, it should only be when all such questions have been fully and convincingly answered. Today's officer report states the commitment to stakeholder consultation and adequate time must be allowed for this before the final decision is made. The parish council must be able to give the detailed plans careful consideration and we must have the time and opportunity to consult residents before we take a firm view one way or the other. This could be the most important development that has taken place in Kidlington for as long as most of us can remember, and it is therefore only right that the Parish Council and residents should have a significant say in the decision. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the next speaker is Neil McWilliams. <coughs> Can I go, Miss? OK. Um, afternoon, everybody. First of all, listen, thank you ever so much for, uh, for allowing us to speak. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, my name, for those of you who don't know me, is Neil McWilliams and I work for Oxford United leading this project. And I'm here to support the recommendation from the officer. But I do agree with the leader. It's really, really important that we respect all views at all times. I think that's something that we've always tried to do, and I think I want to emphasise that to everyone. There are many people here today who will speak much more elo eloquently, with more knowledge and with more passion about Oxford United than I ever will be able to. However, from my perspective, this decision is just not about the new stadium. It's not just about environmental issues, employment or the economy. 
It is about protecting a 30-year-old valued community asset. In effect, a valued in institution that gives so much back. Our county would not be the same without the vibrancy of yellow and blue, without the shared success, the shared success, or even more often than not, shared disappointment. Football is not just about football. It is about social cohesion. It is about shared values. Oxford United is much larger than the game we play. Our aims throughout this process have remained the same. They are to secure world-class facilities for our club and county, in addition to maximising our contribution to the Oxford community. Yet we are no closer to an answer, no closer to saving our club. We have spent the last year working relentlessly on addressing the points raised about Stratfield Break. Despite our best efforts, Stratfield Break was clearly a project with difficulties. Therefore, we have moved our stadium only proposal to the smaller triangle. We have no choice. We have had to change our plans. We must give ourselves a chance of being here after 2026. We have already been through a formal consultation in relation to the triangle. It was part of the original consultation process. A process that Paul Perra said over 80% of respondents, respondents voted in favour. We do not have time for years, months or even weeks of further delay. We are genuinely running out of time to save this football club. Despite the con complexities, and I do understand the complexities, and I do respect other people's views, the decision today is a simple one. Whether it into heads of terms negotiations, the OUSC or not, in reality, it's the same decision as a year ago. Whether you're a supporter of this project or an opponent, I think it would be fair to say that most of us are tired of being trapped in this apparently never-ending debate. But one day, and that day is coming very soon, we will look round and we will still be debating. That's time. Could you? And our feeling? football club will be no more. 130 years of rich history gone. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is Janine Bailey, although she's not here in person, but she has sent a statement, which I think, Chris, you're going to read out. Thank you for the opportunity to address the meeting. I'm speaking as an Oxfordshire resident. My parents, who are not football supporters, live in Kidlington. I have supported Oxford United since the 1970s, and I'm currently a member of Oxford's United Supporters Panel, which represents fans' views. Those fans are diverse coming from every age, social and geographic section of the county's population. On match days, we come together at the county's biggest event to celebrate what unites us, Oxford United. When we gather at matches, we build up communities of friendship, looking out for one another. And that community spirit extends further. Many fans, through their association with the football club, get involved in wider initiatives, such as supporting Charwell Larder during lockdown. Oxford United in the community runs a wide range of social impact programmes throughout the county with all age groups. These include initiatives to improve health and fitness and to reduce reoffending. They build on the good that football can do for the benefit of all. Let me give you some personal examples of the good that football can do. My dad, who lives here in Kidlington, benefited from the lockdown programme to tackle loneliness, joining in with regular Zoom coffee mornings. He does not even go to watch Oxford United but that was no barrier to participation. He is one of the Kidlington residents who supports the proposal to build a stadium here. Members of my immediate family suffer from chronic illness, which significantly affects their life. Their fortnightly trip to support Oxford United is often their only non-medical trip out of the house. It enables them to participate as a spectator and to have much needed social interaction with the community of supporters. All of this will disappear if Oxford United does not have a home to go to in 2026. I understand that loss of Greenbelt must always be carefully considered. The Triangle site is tucked between two dual carriageways and is inaccessible to the public. It contributes nothing which could not be mitigated or even enhanced through careful planning. On the other hand, leaving it as it is would cost the Oxfordshire community dearly. I urge you to agree to your officer's recommendation and proceed to agree heads of terms without delay so that the full planning process can begin. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Gary Allen. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name's Gary Allen. 
and as founder and head coach of the Oxford United Tri-Stars Downs football team, um, I urge you all to make a swift decision regarding the future of our stadium. We also, as constituents and voters, have the right to know what our elected officials intend to do. It is vital to make a decision now, as the current lease on the stadium expires in 2026 and is not to be extended. Time is needed to prepare a live stadium to replace this by then. As someone who has been a supporter of our city's top football club since 1957, when my father took me to my first away game, I ask you all to vote in favour of building a new stadium at either Stratfield Break or the Triangle. Oxford United are a community-led club and must be allowed to survive for the good of our city. Just a little bit about me and why I bought this stadium. In 2014, I was diagnosed with leukaemia and after my chemotherapy in 2016, I could not walk 10 yards without needing to rest. So I joined the Oxford United Walking Football Club in an effort to get fit. I am now in remission, which I believe was due to being able to take part in sport. This makes me believe that we need more first class sporting facilities in our county, not less. Once again, I ask you to make the right decision and improve, approve the application for a new stadium. The future of our community led club is in your hands. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Um, and our next speaker is Richard Haig. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Richard Haig. I'm a Kislington resident for over 20 years and half of that time I've been managing my daughter's football team at Kidlington Youth Club. I'm speaking to you as chair of the vision committee at Kidlington Youth. First of all, I'd like to give you a brief overview of Kidlington Youth. Kidlington Youth is a grassroots football club for all genders. We were formed over 50 years ago, and today we consist of 30 teams and 500 players, with the vast majority coming from Kidlington and surrounding villages. Our teams range from under six to adults. We are the sole provider of competitive female football in Kidlington. We play across three sites in Kidlington, with Stratfield Break providing the majority of our pitches. Currently, we have a number of major issues facing the club. The top one is the number and quality of our pitches. Over the last decade, we have grown mainly due to the tremendous rise in female football. Today, we have 10 girls teams and two ladies teams, which is fantastic. And we are proud to be one of the leading female football clubs in the county. However, we cannot expand further as we have run out of pitches to play on. Our pitches are full on Saturday mornings. We will not be able to handle the anticipated rise in female football, let alone the demand of multiple housing developments in our catchment area. We also face challenges with winter training in Killington, as Killington has no 4G artificial pitches. Our teams are in the ludicrous position of having to travel for training outside of Killington to County, Summertown, and Vista. I'd like to turn now to the current state of Stratford break. Matches are often need to be postponed because of bad drainage and maintenance. We can only use the toilets at Stratford break pavilion and not the changing rooms. The car park is not large enough. But to handle both rugby and football. Finally, the car park and pavilion are at the other end of Stratford break to where the football pitches are leading to access and toilet issues. In short, it's embarrassing to host opposition teams at Stratford Break. Finally, I'd like to give Kidlington Youth's position on the proposal today. Unlike other bodies, we have met with Oxford United regularly over the last year to discuss the proposals to move to Stratford Break and now to the Triangle. Oxford United have always emphasised they, they are a community club and share the same goal of creating top class local sporting facilities. The discussions have been wide ranging and constructive. However, what is needed now are formal strategic talks 
and detailed plans about what can be achieved. We therefore supporting the proposal Doug, for you hi, today. Could you just wrap up your yeah, yeah, thank you. the last two sentences. Therefore, we are supporting the proposal before you today to move forward. These planning activities can then commence with the ultimate objective that Kidlington can be proud of its football facilities for generations to come. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Suzanne McIver. <coughs> Good afternoon, I'm Suzanne McIver and I live near the Triangle. Officers are recommending that Council enter into lease negotiations with Oxford United for a new stadium on the Triangle. Why is this Council proposing moving beyond discussions to formal negotiation at this point without detail, detailed plans from the club and with no public engagement? We're told that the Triangle has already been consulted on as part of the Stratfield break proposals. This is misleading. Under those plans, the triangle would have been retained as open green space for sports pitches. This council has clear constitutional obligations to consult the local community, but is not doing so. Appropriate engagement is essential before any lease negotiations take place, particularly because this proposal is on green belt. As such, the plans would have to pass the very special circumstances test. This is a very high bar much higher than the so-called exceptional circumstances used to justify housing in Charwell. This council has been pressured by Oxford United's insistence that they have to have a new stadium by 2026 and there is no plan B. This is not credible. But in any event, it's not relevant to council's decision making process and this council mustn't allow this to lead to the emission of important stages of consultation. It's up to the club to put plan B in place they are going to need it. As an example, protected species exist on the Triangle site, so an environmental impact assessment will be required. This assessment process takes months, often delays planning, and can also be challenged at various stages. If this ever gets to the planning stage, local challenge will mean that it will end up on the desk of the Secretary of State, and this will take years. The club's website demonstrates that the management believes Stratfield break is still on the table. Today's cabinet papers state otherwise. The council should provide clarity on this for the benefit of all parties. I urge this council to make it absolutely clear to Oxford United and its supporters that Stratfield break is not available for either a stadium or any related development to recognise that the 2026 deadline is not the council's problem and cannot be a reason to avoid timely local engagement and to undertake appropriate consultation at this stage. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ken, our next speaker is Ken Rowe. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ken Rowe. I've been a season ticket holder for Oxford United for 19 years, and I'm also the founder and secretary of the Oxford United Walking Football Club, which is a section of our parent club, Oxford United, who allow us to promote and play football for 50 plus men and 40 plus women of all abilities including players with Down syndrome, which is the only one in Oxford. This is one of the many reasons why it is important to have a professional football club like Oxford United that cares and benefits the local and wider community of Oxfordshire. After our club was relegated from the league, they reached the playoffs final at Wembley in 2010 a memorable day in our club's history. There was amazing support when over 33,000 fans and supporters of all ages from Oxfordshire and beyond came to watch this event. It was an experience I will never ever forget 
as the atmosphere in the stadium was electric, which resulted in a win for our club to be promoted back into the Football League. That day at Wembley, Oxford United, as in the club's name, united the people of Oxfordshire, which is another reason why it is important to deliver a permanent home for future generations to enjoy. Sadly, time is running out. It is with huge passion that I'm appealing to you to expedite the decisions necessary to ensure the building of a new home for our historical football club before the final whistle is blown in 2026. Unlike in football, we don't have extra time. Thank you for listening. Thank you. And our next speaker is Christopher Lowe. <coughs> That's right, that's right. Good afternoon. My name is Christopher Lowe and I'm head of Oxnard in the community. We are the official charity of Oxnard Football Club and we have a strong 30 year plus community engagement and delivery representing Oxnard Football Club. Our vision is that every person in Oxfordshire has a positive connection with Oxnard Football Club and Oxnard in the community every day to inspire happier, healthier and better connected communities. Working collaboratively with local and county-wide delivery partners, we use the power of football to inspire the people and communities of Oxfordshire to have positive aspirations for their future, for their health and well-being, self-confidence, opportunities and resources to achieve them. Our new strategy, Oxfordshire Community United, supports people across the Oxfordshire community from the ages of 2 to 92. We currently deliver 20 different programmes a week. These are covered in our programs. So we do football in the community, we do health and well-being, we do education and employability, youth engagement and development. More than 3,000 people, uh, unique people, access um, our programs a year. This is linked to an additional 10,000 people. We are growing year on year with our expansion across the county within 10 towns in addition to Oxford. In early 2024, we will start in specific projects projects working locally within Kidlington. I'd like to just quote some or read some of our quotes from some of our participants to really start to engage what it means to be part of our programme. So this is a uh, participant, so it's a women's football and wellbeing programme. As a result of the programme, I've actually applied for a new job and I'm pushing myself out of my comfort zone and I feel more confident in myself that I can do and be successful in my new career. A uh, fem female supporter that has, does our Manor Club project. My dad really benefited from your Zoom coffee mornings, the little gifts during lockdown. A teacher that we deliver a school, uh, delivered within a the school. They uh, cannot wait to get outside even when the weather is bad. They leave the sessions high in spirits and return to class with renewed energy the next day. <laughs> I started my journey 17 years ago working one hour a week and I head up the organisation. A journey open to any young person in the county, but if Oxford United Football Club doesn't have a home and doesn't exist, we simply stop existing and the people of Oxfordshire miss out and these opportunities fade into only a dream. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Um, and the next speakers, um, we've got a, a joint statement, but they were unable to attend. So, um, Chris, I believe you've got a statement from them to read out. Is that correct? No, I haven't. Oh, you haven't. OK, OK. In that Okay, we'll move on to our next speaker is Katrina Jenkins. Hello, thank you for allowing me to speak to you today. It is appreciated. For clarity, I am a Kidlington resident and I have lived in the village all my life, but I'm not going to tell you how old I am. Although I'm not a football fan, I'm here to speak to you in support of the potential stadium development. I'm here to speak for a large, respectful, silent group of Kidlington residents who believe this could be a transformational project for both our, our area and Oxfordshire. We have watched with interest how this project has developed and moved from the main Stratfield Break site to the now smaller section of land opposite the main site. We have read with interest the latest papers from the County Council and how after a year it would seem that very little progress has been made. At this stage, I would like to address a few specific points. 
The majority of us are concerned about climate change and the environment and how even in a small way we can help. It is clear that anyone who has genuine concerns about this issue can see how a new stadium built in a sustainable way must be better for the Oxfordshire environment than a stadium that has three stands and the majority of people travel by car to. It is also clear that the suggested site has outstanding public transport links. Regular trains to the city centre, Vista and London, regular buses, park and rides and proposed new cycle highways. Common sense tells us that this would make it easier for people to get out of their cars and travel to this proposed community venue in a more sustainable way. Oxford United have stated that this project is not just about football, it is also about providing international class community facilities for our area and the county. Facilities that are desperately needed in our area. Now that the club have stated this, they should be given the opportunity to work with the local community and formulate a joint plan. This joint working can be completed throughout the planning process. That is the appropriate forum. We are all fully aware that there needs to be development in Oxfordshire to cope with the ever increasing demand. This is the reality of the county that we live in. We know this is going to happen in our area. Our young people deserve the best facilities. We want the best for them. This project is for their generation. It is about opportunities for them. It is not about our generation. And that is why this project should be allowed to progress to the next stage. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next speaker is Victoria Campbell. Good afternoon. I'm speaking to you as a Kidlington resident and on behalf of Friends of Stratfield Break, a community group seeking to protect Stratfield Break and the Triangle site. The lack of proper consultation with local residents who would be significantly impacted by this major infrastructure project is concerning. The paper states the recommendation to proceed aligns with last year's engagement exercise. This simply is not true. There was majority opposition from local residents and the results include individuals from outside the county. The council has now proposed a different potential site. It's procedurally unsound to take results based on a set of criteria for one site and apply them to another. Whereas the wishes of the club have been made very loudly, the views of local residents are at danger of being lost. I urge Cabinet to ensure proper consultation with the local community before lease negotiations are approved. The Council appears to have moved beyond simply reacting to a proposal to now actively enabling potential acquisition of public greenbelt for private commercial development. We oppose the stadium on Stratfield Break or the Triangle. The Triangle was acquired by the Council to maintain a green gap between Oxford and Kidlington. This purpose is unchanged. One of the Council's own criteria for this proposal is retention of a green barrier. A stadium on the Triangle would obliterate it. Is it a good use of Oxfordshire taxpayers' money to proceed with formal lease negotiations on a site which doesn't appear to meet the council's own criteria from the outset? No amount of promised community benefit can overcome this fundamental objection. The Savills report has identified other potential sites. It's unclear if these are being explored in parallel to the triangle. The Football League has emphasised how intrinsically linked the club is to Oxford City and that it must remain there or very close by. Clearly, Oxford City Council should be actively involved in the conversation, but they don't seem to be. Why not? It's not the County Council's responsibility to rehome the club outside of the city, prioritising some groups over others and to the detriment of our community's local green spaces. Would the triangle be better used for additional community sports pitches? Under planning law, the club would need to demonstrate very special circumstances to develop the triangle, a difficult test to achieve particularly if options such as ground sharing or alternative potential sites haven't been properly explored or have been erroneously excluded prematurely. Given so many fundamental uncertainties at this point, can Cabinet please reassure local residents that whatever today's decision may be, this is not a done deal and advise the club to consider all options. Thank you. Thank you and our next speaker is Reva Casley. Thanking you for your, thank you for allowing me the time to speak to you today. My name is Reva Casley and I am the captain of OUWFC. I do not intend to speak to you for very long. You've already had a long day. From our perspective, this decision is not just about 
environmental impact or green belt or transport or even financial considerations. We all understand that those factors are important. However, for us, it is also about equality and social justice. The present license agreement at the Kassam does not allow us to play our women's home league games there. There are not enough, not enough games within the agreement to allow this to happen. As much as we love playing at Oxford City Football Club at present our home ground, we are envious of our colleagues and rivals who play for MK Dons. Not jealous because we want to play for MK, but jealous because they play their home games at the main stadium. A new stadium for all sections at OUFC would allow this to happen. It would allow the women's and girls games to grow even further. A new stadium would bring more equality and have a positive impact on social justice. I'm sure that you all will be aware that at present we sit at the top of our league and hopefully destined for promotion to the championship. In addition, we are at the centre of the development of both women's and girls football and we are building on the success of the Lionesses recent success. We literally have hundreds of players registered at the club, as do many other clubs across the county. At Oxford United, we also provide an elite environment that will help ensure the game continues to grow. A key question for us, why should we not have the same opportunities? Football brings people together. It is not just about football, it is about a sense of belonging. It is about social cohesion, whether that be a men's, boys, girls or women's match. We need the women's game to continue to grow. A professional club is vital to that and a new stadium is vital on the next step to genuine football equality. Whatever decision you decide to make, that decision needs to be made in a timely manner. After a year of waiting and consultation, I think we all deserve an answer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next speaker is Colette Thompson. Hi, I'm Colette Thompson, a local resident, mother, and I have business interests in Killington and the wider Oxfordshire area. I'm here today to speak in favour of Oxford United Stadium and in particular the economic benefits it'll bring. I completed the questionnaire that was a year ago now and none of my views in that questionnaire have changed. I've followed it closely, I've read the arguments for and against which have been repeated throughout today and um, so I won't go over them in too much detail. I think we can all agree there are clear for and against arguments and whilst we absolutely had to put this out for consultation to make sure we captured all views, None of the positions are new or unexpected. Setting aside even the United supporters' views, the arguments for are clearly the boost to the economy, employment and the huge community benefits, and the arguments against the impact on match days with parking and so on, and the environmental impact on the green belt. What I've seen over the last year is Oxford United are hugely committed to addressing each issue and working with the council and the cabinet to do so. What I cannot see as both a mother and a businesswoman is how we address the incredible benefits we lose if we do not address and approve the stadium plans to move forwards. I've been at multiple meetings recently where local councillors and MPs have spoken very candidly to the business people in the area about the pain we are all about to go through. The cost of living crisis that will impact each and every one of us. Unemployment is rising and investment levels therefore fall in both public and private. There isn't the money to invest right now to address these issues. Oxford United, in my opinion, are gifting that to the people of Kidlington and the wider Oxfordshire area. I believe this is far too big for this cabinet to pass up. If we don't say yes to this project, if we don't welcome them in to build this stadium, how are the council going to bridge that gap? Where will we find new jobs? Where will we ever get a £70 million investment? It's just an incredible gift to the entire county. We need to grab that with both hands or we need a really strong and viable economic growth plan. Yes, there are issues to be resolved. Yes, we need to take on board everyone's concerns, but these can be worked through. But we cannot get to the detailed level requested without moving to planning. It's taken a year to get to this point. To keep delaying the move to pre-planning and planning is just effectively frustrating the process. I therefore request the Cabinet to make the decision to enable this move forward as soon as possible and agree to move to heads of terms today. And just finally, as a mother of a boy and a girl, to address the equality, to have Reva sitting here saying we don't have the same opportunity to play in the stadium as the men's first team, will all be put to bed and I want to go home and tell my daughter she can do that. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, our next speaker is Martin Halstead. Thank you for letting me address you today. Uh, I think it's vital during this process that we deal in facts and uh, very little else. I'm a Bedford resident, so just a few minutes away from the proposed site. At the moment, I go to Oxford United every week uh, when we're at home. It's uh, 18 minutes, according to Google Maps, from my home, but uh, rarely does that journey take that long. It's much longer, in fact, normally about an hour. Public transport is a very poor provision for the current stadium with less than 3% capacity of uh, an average match day being provided for by buses and other options. It's absolutely vital that we do something to alleviate the environmental con uh, concerns going forward. However, the current site is not going to address that. It's a one in, one out congested site, home of a lot of pollution and a lot of road congestion. The club has shown absolute flexibility, not just with Stratfield Break and its move towards the Triangle, but in many other sites that have been looked at long prior to the consultation that we stand here with today. This is a Greenbelt site, that must be realised, but really in the strictest view, it, it's not a great piece of land. It's almost scrubland, currently used by a fencing contractor. When compared to the likes of the West Botley solar farm, the impact will be quite minimal. The line of sight for the new stadium will not affect residences nearby. We've got, as I say, we must deal in facts and there's about 80% support for the new stadium. There is a minority, however, who are trying to discredit a lot of what has been said. The talk of a lack of consultation is slightly uh, misleading as this normally would take place in a planning process anyway. I've received leaflets through my door from those who oppose the stadium. What's been worried at times is the social snobbery and the slight xenophobia in some of these, particularly towards the foreign ownership of Oxford United. I think we must remember that Oxford is a world famous city that attracts talent and elite minds. And that's true within the football club as well. Our current ownership have history with Inter Milan and Manchester United and are the best place to deliver on a stadium project as they did in Washington DC with DC United. We need world-class facilities in the city, but we also need a football club, and I believe this can provide both. There's no place for social snobbery. The days of 1980s hooliganism have long passed. The club now fosters long-term friendships and weekly relief from those who suffer from social isolation. During lockdown, the club, players and staff contacted many of those that are the least, uh, most vulnerable in our society and made sure that they had a voice. So I'd like to finish by comparing us with Brighton and Hove Albion. 13 years ago, they had a lower attendance than Oxford United. They were in the same division and much like us didn't own their own stadium. They nearly went out of business. Time, so could you just yep, sure. uh, they nearly went out of business, but today, having moved to a new stadium that they own, they play in the Premier League and have done for the last six seasons and average 31,000 as an average attendance. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, our next speaker is Harry Hall. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for listening to me today. My name is Harry Hall and I am a primary school student. Now, don't worry, I have been given permission to be absent from school. I must be honest, my dad, who helped me write this, and me, are passionate Oxford United fans. Some of our best days have been spent at the Kazam Stadium. When I was a mascot at the Manchester City game, I could not sleep for days and it was great to see the Yellows play against some of the best players in the world. It was a brilliant day. At school, we spend a lot of time learning about the environment and climate change. For all of us, this is extremely important. Every time we go to the Kazam Stadium, we have to drive, as do most other people. But with the new site, there are lots of trains and buses that go there. That has got to make people happy. If my football club is taken away from me, I do not know what I will do. It will be a terrible day in my family's life. In fact, I think it will be a terrible day for Oxfordshire. I know that we have been thrown out of the Kazam Stadium and I know that time is running out for my football club. 
I also know that all of you in this room have the power to save Oxford United. You have the power to give our club hope. My family think the talking has got to stop now and you have to decide we are tired of talking and filling out forms. Please make a decision today and please support our stadium and secure our future. Thank you very much, Harry, and thank you for taking the time off school to talk to us this afternoon. <laughs> Um, the next speaker is um, Ollie Dare, who I believe is online. Hello, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to speak at a meeting and uh, congratulations to Harry for speaking to everyone today. He's a hard act to follow. I have been a resident of Oxfordshire for nearly a decade and I wish to raise with you the serious concerns of my neighbours and I who live in the area north of Oxford about this potential new development. Our area has seen considerable amounts of development in recent years, and we face the prospect of hundreds more homes and acres of solar panels being built in the near future. These projects at least have tangible benefit to our local community in green energy and in potentially the reduced cost of housing. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said of a new football stadium. Destroying our Greenbelt land to erect a huge commercial building would have a devastating effect on our local environment. It will increase noise pollution, worsen traffic congestion and irreparably damage open spaces. Sadly, it also risks bringing to our area the antisocial behaviour that is sometimes associated with football matches. In return, I do not believe our area gets really any commercial benefit. Residents will pay the price of this development. Whether we're considering a stadium on Stratford break or the land nearby in the Triangle, it's clear that there has been no proper local consultation. The only consultation that has taken place is almost entirely of self-declared football fans, hundreds of whom are not even Oxfordshire residents. The majority of those local residents that were able to take part objected to the development of the stadium. It's difficult to see how the council can claim to make a democratic decision on these stadium proposals when only the views of the football club and its fans are being represented. Our community elects councillors to represent our views and not the commercial interests of the football club. Given the concerns of my fellow residents and I, I hope that the council will not enter into negotiations regarding this new stadium, whether on Strat Stratfield Break, I'm sorry, or the Triangle. However, as a bare minimum, surely the council must honour its democratic duty and undertake a proper consultation of local residents, not just football fans, before allowing these plans to progress any further. I do hope that this decision is taken on the behalf of residents and not the football club. Many thanks for your time. Thank you very much. And the next speaker was going to be James Dunn, but I understand he's not able to be here today. So he's got a statement which Chris is going to read out to us. Good afternoon. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. I'm James Dunn, a business and property owner in Kidlington, where I have lived for over 50 years, playing for local football, cricket and rugby teams and refereeing. I'm here to speak in favour of the proposed Oxford United development on the triangle of land opposite the Stratfield Brake site. I'd like to make it clear that I'm an Oxford United supporter. The club means a lot to me, always has done, always will. Our football club has had a lot of problems over the years. We know their license agreement has been terminated. Though many think the club should have been given more protection, it wasn't. This council has the chance to rectify that and make sure our only professional sports club is protected for a century at least. It can rectify the mistakes of other councils. We all understand the difficulties of building on Greenbelt. However, these are genuinely special circumstances. No land, no football club. Oxford United has been told the site at Stratford Break is no longer a possibility. The triangle of land we are discussing is at present neither accessible nor used by the general public, but lends itself perfectly to a stadium. In fact, the new proposed site is the perfect location as a green barrier will still exist between Kidlington and Oxford. It will be much easier for the club to achieve an aim of getting people out of their cars and onto public transport. And a project like this will bring excellent facilities to our area, along with employment and a boost to many sectors of the local community. And Oxford United's work with the community is significant. Football clubs aren't just about football, they are about communities. I think I speak for many when you support the stadium or not. The time is talking about approval is gone. The time for talking about approval is gone. We've had enough of debate and consultation after a year of, well, not much progress. The next stage of consultation is in the planning process. There is no need for more delay. I urge the Cabinet 
to make a defining decision today. Thank you, Chris. Um, and our next speaker is Danielle Walker. Hello, I'm Danielle. I'm speaking to you as a long-standing Kidlington resident, local businesswoman, and much to my husband's delight, a converted Oxford United fan. Definitely not a hooligan though. But most importantly, I speak today as the mother of two young boys growing up in the Kidlington community. I've had to think long and hard about what I would speak about today and how best to get my views across. I thought about how Oxford United would want to come to our community in Kidlington and as such, what sort of neighbour would they be and, or could they be? What seems like many years ago now, I started my working life at Oxfordshire County Council, working in the community with vulnerable children and their family. Many of my families lived in, within the area around the Kassam Stadium in Greater Leeds. Through this, I've seen firsthand that Oxford United have been very proactive in making sure that they have engaged with their neighbours and added value to the communi community, including to some of the families that I once worked with. This wasn't about box ticking. The club went above and beyond to make their lives that bit better. This is what I want for our community in Kidlington. I want them to work with our schools to improve education and participation. I want them to expose children to new opportunities and raise the expectations of their own lives and what they might achieve. I want them to help safeguard vulnerable children and their families, and I want them to provide opportunities for local employment. I want the drip down effect for local businesses who would benefit from more customers, and I want Oxford United to invest in local businesses, improving the local economy. I love living in Kidlington, but even in the time I've lived here, I've seen a slow decline. You just have to walk down the high street to see that. My husband has lived in Kidlington his entire life, and he tells me that if anything, Kidlington is a worse place to live than when he was a child. I worry that when my own children are adults, that Kidlington will be a place where they won't want to or feel proud to live. Kidlington is dying and Oxford United could be the shot in the arm that it needs. I know that the football club already does so much in Kidlington, working with the local schools and also with the Chowell Larder. They help to provide meals for vulnerable children with very little by way of seeking publicity. Oxford United could give new employment opportunities to stop our young people from having to travel to Oxford or Bicester to get a part time job. There are facilities for children, sports teams oversubscribed and no or no non-existent to the point where my own children had to get, go to places like Woodstock or Bicester to play their chosen sports. There aren't enough pitches and those that are available are poorly kept and overused. It is little wonder that our county faces an obesity crisis when available sports facilities are nothing short of embarrassing. That's time. So could Oxford you United are offering to invest in our community to work with all of those existing clubs, teams to find a solution that benefits everyone. Is this really an opportunity that we can pass up? Danielle, could you wrap this up your remarks, please? represents a once in a lifetime opportunity to talk to secure the future for our children and their children. In our household, we are so excited at the prospect of welcoming OFC, OF, OUFC into our community. My children harass me daily. Thank Any you. News, Thank you. What's happening? When will the stadium come? Let's hope we give them some good news. Thank, Thank you very you. much indeed. So the next speaker is uh, Councillor Nigel Simpson. Uh, thank you, Leader. Thank you, Cabinet members. So uh, first of all, Gossel All Blacks representatives are unable to attend in person today, but ask, ask me to share these points. So the All Blacks are the largest sports club at Stratfield Break, is a growing community rugby club, which has more than 450 members and more than 30 teams spanning minis, juries, boys, girls, men, women and touch rugby. Over the last 12 to 14 months, despite working with OUFC, it has not been possible to identify a suitable and acceptable site or process for the relocation of the All Blacks. Uh, due to the change of location, the only option that remains is for the All Blacks to stay put and uh, also with Kidlington Youth Football Club uh, on this uh, current site at Stratfield Break and um, for OUFC to develop the triangle. Hence, we provide our qualified support for the proposal, providing that OUFC honour the verbal commitments to enhance the existing facilities at Stratfield Break, both the pavilion and playing services, 
which we estimate will generate an operational savings for Kidlington Parish Council in excess of two million pounds over the next 10 years. <clears throat> Finally, our equal importance to the All Blacks is what happens to Stratfield Brake facilities if the proposal does not proceed. All parties know that the existing pavilion requires a major upgrade and the playing services need significant development at great cost. If OUFC do not fund this, then will OCC, CDC and Killington Parish Council commit to doing this immediately? So that's a statement from Gossel All Blacks. <coughs> Excuse me. So for me, the two key words that keep coming to my head are community and opportunity. We've heard from various speakers today, the community work that the club do behind the scenes away from sort of the, the football league. Uh, so I won't dwell on that area too much. What we must not forget is that we are not the planning authority here and the real detail will come forward in that phase of the process, which will also allow all residents to have their say. A another consultation at this stage would be pointless as we don't really know what the, we're actually consulting on yet. Uh, all we are assessing is whether we lease a small parcel of land to Oxford United. The proposed site is just over 11 acres of non-accessible land bordered by two main roads, but perfectly perfectly located for existing public transport connections. Uh, the second main word that came into my head was opportunity. So Kidlington and the neighbouring villages are changing whether we like it or not. What we do need now on the back of this growth is quality infrastructure for all of our residents to benefit from. This proposal has the potential to help deliver some of that infrastructure. Um, I got here approximately 20 or so letters from a local primary school, which I met up with recently. And um, so on top of supporting the stadium, some of the ideas they proposed were a youth club. There was currently nothing on offer in Kidlington, rock climbing, family restaurants, better sports facilities, obstacle courses, to name but a few. So these are the next generation that will enjoy the benefit of what we're discussing today. Unfortunately, they don't have a voice in these discussions, but are ones that will really gain on the back of it. Uh, one statement that really stood out whilst reading through, through them was this. This is our dream. You wouldn't want to take that dream away from four young boys, would you? I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next speaker is Councillor Ian Middleton. Thank you, Leah, and thanks to all the public speakers. Um, once again, Cabinet is being recommended to enter into negotiations with OUFC over the release of Greenbelt land in my division. A year ago, that recommendation was deferred to allow the club to provide more details on their proposals. Yet after dire warnings about short timescales, we had to wait eight long months for their response. Even then, despite promises about openness and transparency with all stakeholders in the community, it took a further two months and an FOI request before a heavily redacted report was made generally available. But instead of the clarity we were hoping for, we discovered there'd been a change of plan. The ambi ambitious proposals for the whole site have been abandoned and replaced with a scheme to squeeze the stadium onto a triangle of land that had previously been regarded as an afterthought. And this is where we are now. With hardly any more information than we had this time last year, faced with an entirely different prospect to the one we've been working on for most of that year, still with no answers to the fundamental questions that were posed at the outset. Whilst the bulk of the site has now been removed from consideration, we still don't have enough detail to open negotiations on this new proposal. Of course, we want to help to find the, to help to find the club a new home. But if we're talking about using public assets to do that, we need transparency about what they've done to help themselves. For example, we still don't have evidence that they've been that they've explored all legal remedies to stay where they are. This is something that would be simple to provide. So why are we still waiting? We also don't know what other land they've tried to acquire. We now know that they've commissioned a study on this, but that wasn't completed until October 2022. Yet we were told last year that they'd already explored all other options and come up empty. The study lists other sites with sustainable transport connectivity and, and landowners who may be open to offers, but we don't know if they've been approached with the same vigour as Stratfield Break. Some are owned or part owned by the City Council, who seem conspicuously absent in discussions over the future of a club bearing their name. It's also baffling as to why they've done nothing to prevent the loss of a community asset that we're told will be so good for Kidlington, but apparently isn't valued in Cowley. All while we, we remain fixated on Kidlington, other opportunities could be missed. And I made that point last year, that OUFC shouldn't be putting all their eggs into this one basket. It seems that was good advice, given that the commercial uses such as a hotel, conference centre, retail and leisure space last, that we were told last year were essential for the stadium's viability, will all be excluded on the Triangle site. This land was purchased by the County Council in the 1930s and held in trust for the people of Kidlington to prevent coalescence with the city, 
This is acknowledged in the recommendation of the cabinet, yet seemingly we're considering some sort of Schrodinger sta stadium, a massive structure built to accommodate 18,000 people that will simultaneously occupy this space while maintaining it as an open green barrier. This is a community already facing significant losses of Greenbelt, but the Parish Council's plan to consult the villagers on yet more loss of the Kidlington Gap has apparently been seen as a significant challenge to be overcome. Missing the point that if local support could be demonstrated, that might help establish grounds for exceptions under the NPPF. Despite attempts to paint me and others as oppositional simply for asking challenging questions, I've tried to remain balanced and neutral, even in the face of some pretty unpleasant social media commentary. I've always said I will stand by the wishes of Kidlington residents and I'm still of that mind. While the consultation last year showed there was significant opposition, I honestly don't know what the balance of opinion is on this new proposal, but I think we need to ask that question. This is our decision. The buck can't simply be passed to the planning authority, as by then we'll have essentially condoned development on Greenbelt by agreeing in principle to its release while opposing this elsewhere. To justify such a position, it has to have the support of the community. One of this council's core priority is to play our part in a vibrant and participatory local democracy. If we really mean that, we can't sidestep local opinion on a proposal that will have a significant impact on the community. We've all seen other councils do that, but we've set ourselves up to be better than that. So I ask Cabinet to move an amendment to commit to a focused local consultation after we've had all the answers to all the outstanding issues, but before any decision is taken. Our decision has to have the majority support of the people who live, who will live with the outcome for decades to come. Let's show them there's a better way to do things. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and the next speaker is Councillor Liam Walker. Thank you, Leader. So uh, here we are again, nearly a year on from the last cabinet meeting, where are you discussing the future of Oxford United? Now, many in the room uh, and watching online will wonder perhaps what progress has been made since that meeting back in March. Uh, we have at least had a consultation which clearly showed overwhelming support for Oxford United to relocate to Stratfield Break, uh, a consultation that was rightly for all residents of Oxfordshire, football fans or not. But sadly, here we are with a slightly different proposal before you. The potential opportunities for Stratfield Break site now kicked into the long grass due to anti-campaigners uh, and parish councils failing to make a decision. Uh, instead, the parish council in Kidlington will continue to spend an incredible amount of local taxpayers' money to keep that old building up to scratch. I do feel deeply for the local sports clubs who we've heard from today, who with the original proposal would have seen huge benefits of better sporting facilities and more investment in local teams, helping them to succeed. All is lot, lot lost though. I'm sure like all of us, Oxford United will support the many clubs in the surrounding area in having better facilities with this new proposal to build the stadium uh, and the home of Oxford United on land known to us all as the Triangle. This piece of land is not used, it's not accessible to the public uh, and has no value to the local community. But just imagine what it could become instead, a world-class environmentally friendly facility for the local community, for the club and for the next generation of football legends in this county. The level of support from the fans right across Oxfordshire has shown how much this club means from so many, including young Harry, who was incredible, by the way. There really is no such thing as just a football club. The club have clearly outlined their need to move from the Kassam and have made clear the other options that have been considered over the many, many years to get to this stage. The idea of more consultation or public engagement, as it's now being referenced, would just mean more uncertainty, not just for the club, but for the supporting community in Oxfordshire and risk time running out. As it's already been made clear, and as you all know, whether the stadium gets built is a matter for Chirwell District Council as the local planning authority. The agreement for the land with the County Council is only the first hurdle for the club and your approval today means they'll be able to progress to the next stage. There are of course those who have spoken today or have been very vocal elsewhere against the new stadium being built. I respect their views like many of you but these objections and concerns should rightly be fed into the legal planning process when plans have actually been submitted. I urge Cabinet to accept the recommendations before you today 
move on with entering into negotiation regarding the heads of terms with the club ASAP. No more diver and delay. Don't kick the can down the road. Let's get this done. Thank you. Thank you and thank you to all our speakers this afternoon and to everybody that submitted written um, statements on about um, about this project. Um, I'm going to ask Councillor Miller to respond to those speakers and also to address the paper itself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. I want to begin by, like you, thanking all of our speakers today. As you said at the start, this is a debate that has inflamed passions, and I appreciate the extent to which all of the speakers have spoken respectfully, uh, including with regard to those who hold a different view to them. So um, I'd just like to address some of the points in the paper uh, and, and seek to respond to some of the points that we've heard from the speakers today. I think the first thing to say is that the County Council has made clear that we wish Oxford United Football Club to succeed and to prosper as the county's only professional football club. And we are committed to working with the club in its search for permanent home. I want to thank the officers who have been working hard on this over the last year and in preparing this report. Secondly, we have been listening. In the last fortnight, I've met with the parish councils of Kidlington and Gosford and Water Eaton, with local councillors and with representatives of the football club and with the Friends of Stratfield Brake. I know that I and many other cabinet members have received many emails from residents who shared their views with us. We've read these carefully. And of course, we have listened carefully to the speakers today. I think it's fair to say that the proposal has excited passions across the county. We can all empathise with those feelings and many of the speakers have made them very clear, including reaching back into the history of their families. So I want to thank them again for what they've said today. But it's important also that we bear in mind some facts about why we are here today. We're having this conversation because Oxford United's licence to play at the Kassam Stadium ends in 2026. The club have provided officers with evidence of the end of this licence and given assurances that all avenues have been explored, including with the City Council to extend this lease. That is the basis on which a proposal to build on this site is being considered. As many speakers have said, that arises because mistakes were made in the past which had put the club in this position, and those are not mistakes of the making of this County Council. The original proposal from the club to use Stratfield Break presents considerable challenges, given this is Greenbelt land and part of the green barrier between Kidlington and Oxford, as speakers on both sides of the debate have acknowledged. The County Council had no previous plans to develop this site and we are therefore responding to the club's proposal. The County Council has been clear from the start that any final proposal would need to demonstrate considerable community benefits and alignment with the Council's strategic priorities to justify the use of this land. From the start, the club has also spoken positively about its commitment to a series of community benefits, and many of our speakers today have alluded to those and spoken positively about them. In the public engagement we held before March 2022, we received feedback on our proposed objectives. There was broad support for these, and we took on board some suggestions in confirming our objectives. We have not changed the goalposts, and we continue to seek the information from the club that would demonstrate how these objectives would be met. So taking account of these strategic objectives and, and our priorities, we've today ruled out the use of the full Stratfield break site for large scale commercial development in the recommendations. When we listen to the passion of the club supporters and the needs of the club, it's for a new stadium to provide a stable permanent home. It's not appropriate for the council to facilitate a large commercial development. Instead, we've asked the club to focus its proposal on the use of the triangle, an area of land large enough to house a stadium of the size the club has proposed. So I think it's important to emphasise that today's decision is not a green light for a new stadium to go ahead. Instead, a decision would come back to Cabinet in due course on whether or not to approve an agreement with OUFC. And a key part of this will be ensuring that any agreement protects the county's financial interests and that it can enshrine the undertakings given by the club to the community as part of its proposal. We can see examples all around the country of local authorities getting into real difficulty as the landlords stay here, and we need to protect all of the taxpayers of Oxfordshire from that risk. Now, a number of the speakers today have spoken of delays, and I want to make clear that has not been on the part of Oxfordshire County Council. We clearly set out our objectives. The club took its time to appoint advisors and eventually provided a report in November. If we're repeating conversations today, as some speakers have said, it's because there's not yet enough information to make a judgment against the objectives. Many of the club supporters have written to cabinet members to express their views, and we're committed to engaging with the club. The work now lies with the club, and we'd encourage the club's owners, executives and consultants to accelerate their work to prepare the detailed proposals we need in order to make a judgment about whether or not our objectives are met. 
As many speakers have said, delay is in no one's interest. So it's now up to OUFC to work fast and come back with more detailed plans which show it can meet the county council's objectives. I will ask officers to start work tomorrow with the club to develop a timetable for the provision and publication of information. This needs to be an open and transparent process. So with the club, we will spell out the opportunities for ongoing public engagement and ensure that there's sufficient time for meaningful public input to the club's proposals before a final decision by the cabinet. This is clearly an opportunity for the club, but it's also not without consequences for the community. That's why we identified objectives for the use of this public land. So we urge the club to provide the information on their proposals without delay, and we will continue to work constructively with them starting tomorrow. Thank you very much. Um, I'm looking at the monitor on the wall behind us. It's gone red, which means that there's too much carbon dioxide in this room. Um, I'm going to suggest that we take a 10 minute break to see if we can sort of clear the air a bit before we come back to debate this. Um, so if we wouldn't mind spending a few minutes outside, we'll wait until that goes green again. We have opened the windows, but it doesn't seem to be making very much difference. So we'll adjourn for 10 minutes and be back at 25 past. Yes, we will open the doors as well. Thank you.
We're now live again, so thank you very much everybody for that break. Um, we've got the windows open now, so hopefully we won't be too cold, um, but we can now resume. And I think, um, Duncan, Councillor Enright, you had your hand up just before we left the room, so over to you. Uh, yes, thank you very much indeed, Leader, and thank you so much to everybody who came in to address the uh, Cabinet today. Um, it was it was wonderful to hear from so many people who were talking about the community value of the club as well as the sporting value. Um, and I was particularly struck by a couple of the um, contributions. First of all, Richard Haig talking about um, the youth um, football in the area and the importance, therefore, of um, uh, developing uh, football in the Kidlington area. Uh, which is critical. It was also interesting to hear from Ken Rowe as well about the walking football club. Uh, something we all might take an interest in, I think. Um, and But that benefit to the wider community of spreading both the game, but also the community benefits of U uh, Oxford University Football Club, I think is is um, understated. Somebody mentioned, I can't remember who it was, about the lack of uh, publicity that the football club does. It doesn't often promote the work that it does in the community, but I'm very strongly aware of that in Whitney, and I'm sure that others are right across the county. Um, we know we have a responsibility here um, to uh, the taxpayers of Oxfordshire to make sure that um, their interests are safeguarded and that includes in the use of our resources, includes the use of our land. But we also know uh, and love our football club and we'll always stand by them and we want to do the right thing by them too, which is why I think it's right that we're taking a very um, careful approach to decision making in this area and why it's good that so many people from across the county have taken the time to write to us all over the last few days and weeks um, and I've never had such a post bag and we haven't exactly um, had um, a lack of other issues on which people are happy to write to us but this has been I think the uh, the biggest issue in my inbox uh, that I've ever had um, and so many stories about people's lives people's families uh, the impact that the club has on them and not just in uh, sporting support uh, although we know that um, all being well, we will have two clubs from Oxford United getting promoted this year. Um, it was particularly interesting to hear Harry and others, through Councillor Simpson in particular, talk about what young people feel about the football club and how important it is for their future. We all want to see a healthy future for Oxford United Football Club and the deliberative approach to making decisions in this area is, is to ensure that the County Council plays the right role and doesn't take a misstep in supporting Oxford United. There is no question that we want to support Oxford United now and forever in the future. Come on you yellows. Um, what we need to determine now is how best to do that, which is why I'd like to propose the recommendations in the paper to proceed immediately to negotiating key terms. We know that some of the issues concerned here also more rightly belong in the planning process and Council Walker pointed that out. So Charwell District Council will very soon have a role to play in this. We just need to make sure that we get our County Council bit right and that's in our role as a landowner and our other roles as Highways Authority and, and our role in strategic planning will play out through the Charwell District Council planning process, as well as being in part addressed by the work that's going on right now. Finally, I'd, I'd like to thank the club, the directors, uh, the owners for all of their work so far. Uh, we stand with you in wanting a really healthy future for Oxford United Football Club uh, and a big win against Shrewsbury uh, a week on Saturday, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Phillips. Thank you, Leader. Yeah, I'm really happy to support the recommendations of this paper. Um, and I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank everybody who's taken the trouble to get in, in touch with us all. Um, I've been so impressed by the passion and the commitment and all the stories and the memories that they've shared with us. Um, I live in Headington uh, and, I, and I do remember the manner and lovely stories about children on tiptoes desperate to see what's going on. Uh, the emails go into a lot of detail about how the club contributes to the well-being of the Oxfordshire community and that's been echoed by the speakers we heard today. The stadium is clearly more than just a venue for league and cup matches. Um, 
I had one correspondent tell me that uh, you can change your job, you can you can change where you live, you can even change your wife, but you can never change a football club. So we've received many supportive emails from all over the world, including uh, Seattle, Sweden, and even Swindon. Um, so just to reiterate, the planning authority is Charwell District Council, but this decision today is a crucial step in delivering the dream for thousands of Oxfordshire residents. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Brighouse. Thank you. I'm very pleased to be able to support um, this recommendation that we have written before us today, um, particularly because uh, of what Councillor Phillips has just said about you can change your, um, you could actually, you can't change your football team, you might be, you might change your wife. And I'm certainly not up for changing. Um, so I'm very, very, very happy to be able to support this today. My husband's a navid Oxford United foot, uh, football fan, and I've got many memories of, 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 of Oxford United. Memories of Wembley, memories of the World of the, in the World Cup, the Milk Cup being held high over um over the Manor football ground and, and attended when it was at the Manor very often. I didn't attend at Kazam hardly at all because of the fact that it didn't feel like a football uh, a football club to me with that big open yawning bit at the side which showed me that actually Oxford United weren't in control but someone else was. I, I do feel today what has really um, hit me was Reva talking about the fact that the, the license didn't allow for the women's football club to be able to play at the Kazam. How awful is that? But Harry, Harry Hall was the star for me. Um, it's how we reach into the future. We must be standing beside Oxford United as they meet this challenge of finding the new, the new football ground at a time whenever um, Kazam has now, is now ready to, um, to throw them out. So, I'm pleased to support them. I, I look forward to getting the timetable of how this is going to be managed and to ensure that um, that we do have this amazing football club carrying on into the future. Thank you. Councillor Bearder. Thank you very much. I, I would also like to thank everybody who's written to me and there's been many, many hundreds of people who have written to me over the last a uh, month or so, I heard from an old friend who now lives in Stockholm, who is still urging me to support the club. Um, my, my, my association with Oxford United, although tenuous at points, it goes back a long way as, as Councillor Brighouse is. Where we were all very honoured when uh, um, Billy Hamilton moved into our village back in the day. Um, and uh, I bought his his board game, um, and I don't think uh, Jerome Sale, my friend from BBC Oxford, would forgive me if I did anything uh, to uh, against the club. And uh, I, I agree with Councillor Enright that, that we we always want to see the best for that. But we have heard from people today who are concerned about the green belt and some very valid concerns as well. So this is is fi is finely balanced, and I think uh, Councillor Miller is playing it with an admirably straight bat uh, and doing a very good job at that uh, as well. Um, lots of people, including. Uh, Councillor Middleton have asked about um, consultation. That was a theme that ran through a lot of the people who spoke today. And I wonder if Councillor Miller could elaborate on, on how we do address that um, uh, and perhaps, you know, uh, uh, make sure that there's uh, transparent and openness throughout this process. But um, generally, I, I support the position we're, we're at and the recommendations. Thank you very much. Um, anybody else want to speak on this? Councillor Ligo, no, you're shaking your head. Thank I'm you. just before we second this. OK, well, well, we'll get to that point in a second. Um, I'm going to hand back to Councillor Miller to respond to what's been said. Thank you, Leader, and, and thanks to everyone for, uh, and my Cabinet colleagues for, for their comments. Um, it, it feels as though the support for this proposal, um, we, we, will, uh, we will hear in a moment what we vote, but I'm grateful to the officers for these clear recommendations. To respond to uh, Councillor Bearder's question, um, the club um, uh, has 
committed uh, in conversations with us to work very closely with officers to set out the timetable over which it will provide the information that's been requested. And it would be our intention in order to maintain the openness and transparency of the process to publish that at the soonest possible um, availability so that everybody can understand what that timeline looks like. Many speakers have spoken today about frustration with delays. I think the best way to counter that is to put out in the public domain the aspiration and the timetable. Um, so that would be the plan. And alongside that, as well as providing opportunity for scrutiny just by being transparent, uh, it is in the report and the recommendation to us that we receive regular updates and that before a final decision is taken uh, by the cabinet on the uh, on whether or not the objectives that we've um, set for this proposal are met, um, that there will be an opportunity to make sure that we uh, receive a, a range of public views from key stakeholders and we will make sure the timetable allows for that. I should just refer to one final thing. It's been raised in, in some of the comments and um, the history uh, of the uh, of the CASAM. And I said in my earlier remarks that we've been assured by the club uh, that the license comes to an end in 2026 and that there is no opportunity to extend that. That's very clearly the assumption and the basis behind this and um, having said that um, you know we will work swiftly in order to um, to put out that timetable and to work with the club over information but I know that the club will be thinking hard about 2026 and beyond and you know as many speakers have said it is very important that the club has options at that point and I would encourage the club to keep those in mind because despite the best will in the world we have a timeline that extends well beyond our activities to Trailwell's process and a plan B is critical if the club about which everyone has spoken with such passion today is to assure it's playing uh, for the 26-27 season. Thanks. Thank you. So um, I think it was Councillor Phillips who said that you wanted to propose this. Um, and I'm not going to read out in detail um, recommendations A to F, but I would like to just say that um, and re-emphasise what's already been said, which is this is about entering into negotiations with the football club on heads of terms and that they are non-binding um, and that we will be setting a number of our own um, our own conditions around this um, and that we expect the football club also to be engaging with um, the public um, as well as ourselves. Um, did you want to say something, Councillor Ligo? You no, no, OK, you want to second? Yes, OK, so um, I'm asked to um, um, I'm asking for agreement to the first set of recommendations, which is A to F. Um, Councillor Phillips is moving and Councillor Ligo you're seconding, is that right? Thank you very much indeed. So having agreed to those, we're now asked to look at um, a second set of recommendations, um, which basically outline um, the conditions on which we're going to be discussing this with the football club, which are in line with our own strategic priorities as a council. And they include things like ensuring that there's a green barrier between Oxford and Kidlington, um, ensuring that um, we enhance facilities for local sports groups um, and develop employment opportunities in the county and also support the County Council's net zero carbon emissions pledge, um, just to summarise those, those conditions. So this is not an unconditional discussion with the football club, um, but we look forward to some very um, it, su su some successful negotiations with them. Um, so we're asked to agree. Um, do I have a proposal for that? Oh, I seem to have several. Um, Councillor Enright, a seconder. And Councillor Ligo, to second. Thank you very much indeed. And thanks again to everybody that's come today um, to represent uh, their views to us. Um, thanks to the 1,400 people, I think, wrote to us about this. It's a very, very lot. There's been a lot of engagement on this. Um, and thanks to everybody for your contribution. We look forward very much to um, hearing again from you when we come back to Cabinet with the next stage of proposals. Thank you all very much. So we'll now move on to item number seven on the agenda, which is the report from the Scrutiny Committee